everyone. This is Sophia Smallstorm. I've been asked to host a roundtable with some of our favorite people about the recent Flat Earth Conference in Raleigh, North Carolina. Now, I just want everyone to know, my experience with this conference is zero. I did not attend, and I haven't even had a chance to watch anybody's presentation. But I'm very curious about it, and some of my very good friends attended, and they all are very intelligent people. One of them was a speaker there. So I'm going to awaken the discussion to the participants, who are Jaren of Jarenism, the YouTube channel. Hi, Jaren. How are you? Doing great, Sophia. How about you? I'm fine. Thank you for joining. And then David Weiss, who was an attendee, not a speaker at the Flat Earth Conference. Hi, David. I'm doing well, and I was on a, a question and answer panel that was a lot of fun. Good. And then there's Mike Williams, our favorite sage of Quay, who actually lives in the area, and he stopped in and spent several hours at the Flat Earth Conference. So we got a range of different kinds of participation, and I'm the black sheet, mine was zero. Mike uh, got frozen again and is probably rebooting. I'm not sure what's going on with him. All right, well, while he's absent, then let's just continue this. Do you want to just start with general reflections since both of you attended and were there for the whole duration? Jaron was the speaker. Why don't we start with Jaron? Sure. Um, you know, one thing I would say from the start is that if it were me who put it on, I would be very proud of myself because I thought that uh, I, did, I certainly didn't expect it to go as it did. Uh, it seemed to kind of go off without a hitch. If, you know, there was the minor audio problems here or there. Or when I got up to speak, my intro video played like four times on a loop rather than just the one time like it should have. So there was little things like that. But from the time I got there, it was a beautiful hotel, very nice. You know, the rooms were huge and the event seemed to go great. People were happy. People were friendly. Towards the last day, everybody I was talking to, I was saying, you know, did you enjoy yourself? Did you have a great time? And I did not hear anybody who, you know, had anything but good things to say. And the only thing for me, the only bump in the road was there was a certain point in the conference where uh, things got a little bit overly Christian with a, a pastor, uh, Pastor Dean Odell, kind of went a little bit further than the, I guess I would say the direction that the conference was supposed to be in. Uh, Robbie, when he opened the conference, said that, you know, we're very open to all different faiths and all different beliefs, and we're here to prove the earth is flat. And then in Dean Odell's speech, at one point, he went into a little dialogue about Jesus being the only way and the truth, and that anybody who doesn't believe that will end up in hellish places. And somebody spoke out from the crowd because they were upset that what things that he was saying, and it kind of got a little heated for a second, and then that person was removed. And But, but besides that, there was really nothing that I don't think anybody could say that they felt cheated by the event or that they didn't enjoy it or that they thought that it was a bunch of BS. I haven't heard that from anybody. Um, I've heard that from other channels and people saying, oh, well, so he must have pocketed a bunch of money and there's no way it costs that much to run a... But I've, I've looked into those things before and it's not cheap to run a 500-person or 600-person conference in a hotel like that with uh, beverages served and with... I mean, it was just really impressive, I think, that for a first time, that we came out basically unbruised. So that that's kind of my overall opinion of it. And he was very nice to me. You know, I had agreed to go well before anything was paid for. I told him, yeah, I'll be there. I'll pay my own way. And then after about two months of ticket sales, he got in contact with me and said, hey, I can pay for your room. And I said, that'd be fantastic. And then about two months after that, he contacted me again and said, um, I know that you aren't making a lot of money online. And so if you want to, I can pay for your flight. So that really helped me. I mean, I was all taken care of. I have nothing but really good things to say about it. Well, that's very good to hear. You know, it's nice that he could uh, come to you in increments and offer more assistance and that he sold so many tickets. I think that's wonderful. And I heard from Mike that the conference was very well done, very polished. So I would call it, uh, from my impression, from what you're saying, a very classy event as the execution of it went. And I'll tell you one thing, I intended ConspiracyCon and a couple of other smaller events in my time. 
when these were going on more prolifically. And I have to say, there is nothing like being surrounded by and being in the company of like minds, even though you might have certain differences, certain disagreements about certain kinds of things, but to be surrounded by the spirit of people who are awake and alive and seeking information eagerly and are just all in this kind of enthusiasm, all in the same place. I thought that that was very, very dynamic, very wonderful, very magical. And everyone that was at those events with me felt the same way, just the way you're describing. So David, how did you feel? I know you're deep in the center of the Flat Earth well, and you're connected with a lot of people in this community. So you finally got to meet them, right? I'm actually at the exact center and everything rotates around me. <laughs> um, that's just a joke. A bunch of bullshit. <laughs> it was amazing to be around six, seven hundred like-minded people. Um, there was a moment where we were hanging out in the hotel atrium in the bar area. There was two uh, sports games on on the big screens, and not a single person was paying attention to the TV. Everybody was talking uh, about relevant world information, and it was amazing. It was. It was good. And about the heavy Christian slant, and, uh, and that is something that I'm very sensitive to. I, I've said many times that in my research years ago, you mentioned God, I'm out. I, and I just discounted everything you told me that I liked before you said that. I found Pastor Dean's speech interesting. It definitely went over the edge on the Christianity side, and there was a large segment of the audience that was backing him up with uh, you know, the amens. It did feel like I was in a church by the end of it, but I thought it was quite interesting. I think that he agrees that, that he will tone it down if he speaks again next year. And Robbie, the organizer, I don't think he intended it to be that religious-based. So again, you know, for a first-year conference, I give it an A+. Plus. It was amazing, and I think next year in Denver is going to be uh, 10 times better. Well, I'm glad to hear that, David, from you. And I want to ask this. Were the presentations actually informative in the sense that speakers came with new material that they hadn't previously aired on YouTube or discussed in roundtables or chat groups or presentations of one kind or another? Or was it just a, here I am, this is me, Jaron, and I'm going to talk about being with all of you and share the wonderfulness of celebrating the flat earth. How were the presentations? I'll speak for me. And the weird thing for me is that I changed my mind last second because I did have a presentation planned with a, with a uh, PowerPoint. And I just felt that when I got there, it was like too much like my videos. And I was thinking the exact same thing that you are that I said, man, I don't want people just to, um, cause I started thinking everybody that's going to be here has seen all my videos and, do I want to bring something new? So last second, I changed my mind and went with more of a a talk and didn't have any audio or any visual aids. I just spoke from the heart and kind of talked about what we believe in and things like that. Now, looking back, I wish I would have done my first idea. But I'd say as far as everybody else's went, I learned some new things. Uh, I think that sometimes we get locked into this idea that everybody has seen every video that we have. and I think that there's so many people that haven't seen so much. And I noticed a lot of things being said that the crowd reacted as if they had never heard that before or had never seen that particular picture. Or Iru Landucci, who came from Argentina, I believe, had a lot of NASA information and, and NASA fakery proofs and things. Like, and I think that that was a great uh, presentation. So to me, I do think there was a, a good mixture of new stuff and some stuff that we've seen before. But again, it may be stuff that I've seen before, but I can't speak for everybody that was there. And again, I never heard one thing from somebody there saying, uh, you know, it was just a bunch of the same old stuff we'd heard. Everybody seemed to be genuinely excited to be there. And I do think that that's part of it, though. It was the first time a lot of us got together. I'd never met Bob Nodal and Cami Nodal, who Bob is my co-host on Globebusters for the past two and a half years. And I've never met him. I never met David Weiss. We talked for hours, never met him, never met any of these people. And I think that is important because getting to see people face to face, I think, brought us closer together, which should help going forward. And we'll have to see how that turns out. But getting to see people, it just helps you realize that they are real. They believe what they say. 
They're not just a, you know, a screen name behind a computer. So to me, I think that even if we'd heard everything before, the point of getting together, you know, was important. Now, granted, we could have done it much cheaper. We could have met at a park. But I think overall, there was a good mixture. Would you agree, Dave? Absolutely. And I disagree with uh, your second guessing your last minute decision. I was thinking that this is really just going to be a giant meetup and we're not going to learn hardly anything new. Uh, I did learn something new and I liked your uh, heartfelt speech. It really resonated with the media, I believe. It, I was talking to a, a couple reporters after and uh, they were commenting on your speech. It really makes you think. And then we had Iru come up and do his thing. We had uh, Yur and Bob's presentation and Iru on gl Globusters, more proofs. Uh, I think it was a great balance and I think you made the right choice. David, can I ask this? Was media there? I know there was that, you know, little short thing that came on YouTube. Somebody posted it and it was a media inquiry into the Flat Earth Conference. And I put that on my blog. I said, starring our own David Weiss. But uh, yeah, you managed to elbow your way into the center of that thing too. You geocentrist, you Weiss-centrist. <laughs> I, I am geocentric. <laughs> Did media hang around? Did they actually wait and hear stuff? So the media was there from the day before through uh, the day after. They were there for three or four days, most of them. They were doing lots of interviews. Some of them got in and listened to some of the lectures. HBO Vice was there the entire time. And I spoke with the, the crew of four or five. And they are definitely flat curious. They're asking real questions now. They thought it was a joke when they got there, and they're, they have seeds planted in them that will uh, never never get dislodged. So they're coming out this Friday with a piece. Jaron and I did an interview at the Billboard with them, along with other interviews that they're going to squeeze into a seven-minute video. So we'll see how that gets chopped up. The BBC was there, and they just released a hatchet piece today trying to make us look very crazy. They, they, oh, this artist guy showed up with a crazy car painted in colors and signs and uh, parked out front and they they flocked to him but he actually came off as a normal guy but subliminally people are watching this going oh this guy's crazy flat earthers are crazy and when you watch their piece uh what auto plays after it which is amazing is uh scott kelly astronaut one how what's what's it like living in space for a year it auto plays right after you watch this two minute piece hit piece they did. So that was interesting. Um, who else was there, Jaron? We had ABC, the local ABC news was there. We had uh, Nightline was there doing a lot of interviews. No, I did an interview with Good Morning Australia. I'm not sure what the name of the uh, some Australian news show. Right. Well, I'm very impressed. That's quite amazing. And I know they can interview people at length and then they can just take bits and pieces and make everybody look really silly. But that's incredible that they were there. And on some level, you know, you do influence those people. And I would like to say this, that we are electrical beings and there's a tremendous amount of electricity and electromagnetism in this world and around this world that we live on or in. And when you actually meet someone physically, their electromagnetic field, their electromagnetism and yours are mixing and interacting and playing off one another. And that's why it's so special and amazing and such a, an experience to actually meet people in yeah. the flesh because you're meeting them in their own electricity and they're meeting you in yours. And that's a very big piece of the flat earth discussion in my book. It's electrical. I just watched a, a piece that Globusters uploaded last night about gravity and how it's a static charge um, that is the cause of gravity. So maybe our static charge is attracting people and personalities together. Yeah, you know, you need to be able to wrestle with some concepts that are foreign to people who are not versed in electricity, physics, even though some of the physics we are told probably isn't true. But it's been hard for me to get into this flat earth learning world because some of it is too technical for me to grapple with. You know, it takes kind of concentration and time and I just want to give up because it's too hard. 
There's a lot of researchers and channels that are out there that boil it down. Those types of channels where they essentially just take the complex stuff and they get it down to more of a layman's understanding of how it works. Of course, there's more to it, but at least a person can leave getting a basic understanding. And one of those channels for me, in case anybody's wondering, would be Dr. Zach. I like Dr. Zach's channel. He does a lot of very good work. Uh, behind the scenes, there's a lot of complicated math that he's doing, uh, computer-aided design. I'm just using him as an example, but he breaks it down to the point where uh, you don't have to get into his math. He just will explain to you the outcome and what it means. Now, was he at the conference? He was not. So, But he was there in spirit. And uh, Jaron, you want to talk about FE Core that he's involved in a little bit Just uh, that was announced at the conference? Yeah, sure. Uh, it was about I don't know if it was six months ago or, or four months ago at this point that Bob was talking to me about this group of guys getting together that include Mike Cavanaugh, Chris from the Sun and Moon group, Dr. Zach, this guy Sandor, Karen B., just a, a, a good group of people that were getting together and talking about experiments. And uh, a couple of them had been approached at various events about uh, funding experiments. And one of the things that they were asked was, are you a... 501c3, or are you a tax exempt company? And so they said, no, you know, we don't have anything. They said, oh, well, we can't, you know, we're not going to donate because of that reason. So in a Skype call one day, we had all got together and talked about, is that a possibility? How, what does it entail? How would we go about that so that we could accept uh, donations if we had that offer in the future? And so we started talking, and sure enough, Every week we had a conference call where it was just a real kind of quick update and where we're at and you know what things we're looking into. Then we got in contact with a company that started the 501c3 paperwork for us, which is a lot more detailed than I think people think. Huge packets of paper, bylaws, naming your board. But we just kept going through all these processes and uh, sent the paperwork off. And so everything kind of came through last second, just in time for the conference. So they announced it at the conference. Uh, it's called FE Core, which stands for Field Engineers Collectively Observing and Researching Earth, but kind of has the hidden FE in there. Uh, we also realized that if you are looking for funding and doing experiments, we probably didn't want to have the flat earth moniker connected to it, even though it's kind of a known thing, just wanted to kind of not have the eyes right on you from the start. So we just named it FE Core. And it was announced at the thing and, um, you know, there's been mixed reviews, of course, online, as there always is people saying, oh, it's all about the money. And and again, I can only speak for myself. And that was never what it was about. It was about us getting together, creating a collective research organization where we can possibly get funding to do some of these experiments that people think everything is real easy and it's real cheap. And it's not, you know, some of these devices that you need to like a ring laser gyro. Uh, which they say is the only gyroscope that can uh, detect the curvature or detect the uh, spin of the earth. You know, one of those is $20,000. So, you know, it's not something we can just go out and buy. It's not something we feel comfortable crowdfunding. So this was just a great idea. And we're going to see where it goes from there. See if now that it's uh, been announced, if we do get some of these guys coming forward to donate for research reasons. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to change the path of the world, which has gone down a theoretical, you know, imagination game where everything is built upon previous imaginations and they never go back to the beginning, their foundations and re-examine um, the very beginning of everything, because that's where I think it went wrong when you look at the history of it. So I'm glad to be a part of it. Bob's a part of it. Like I said, you know, those other guys in it, I have huge respect, like uh, Mike just said for Dr. Zach, so hearing his name and him being involved in it was uh, big for me and Sandor, and I've always enjoyed Mike Cavanaugh. So just seeing the group of people that were talking and were showing, and so is uh, the MC Rick Hummer. So these people I uh, got to know every week. We have a conference call. We have one today. And they're quick. They We get on. We touch bases. What is everybody working on? What is everybody doing? Here's what we need to do. We have a secretary who takes minutes because that's what you have to do when you're a 501c3. And we just keep plugging forward. It's a research-based organization, and that's uh, huge. I think it's kind of the direction that we needed to go. We couldn't just all aimlessly wander around and, and do little experiments on our kitchen table. 
if we're actually planning on making an impact in the world. So that was announced, and I think it was well-received, at least at the event. Yeah, it's absolutely necessary. Jaron, I was very glad to hear that it's going down that path. There needs to be hard science. There needs to be hardcore research going on. The flat earth community or the flat earth work or geocentrism, however you want to you know, phrase it, it cannot continue as a hodgepodge of patchwork of you know videos and personalities. It has to condense down to research and it has to get down to science. So I was very glad to hear that the FE core group has formed. The other thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to open it up to people who have experiment ideas to submit ideas and if we have the funding to do them to grant those people the funding to do their experiments so i mean that's that's something i had thought about doing i have a uh, patreon where you know like i think 90 people uh, donate to me monthly and i've always thought like man it'd be awesome if i could because i now at this point have two or three of these lasers and i was like when i'm done using them i'd love to open it up to my patrons to request it Hey, Jaron, can I use that laser to do an experiment? I would love to send it to him. So it's kind of that on a larger scale. Um, I think we want to include people. We want people to be able to submit experiments, to follow along with experiments, and then to have the data afterwards to either you know build from or refer to. So yeah, overall, anybody who's got anything negative to say about it doesn't know our intent. I've heard people say, oh, you guys are going to make great salaries. None of us are getting paid a penny. It's not the way it works. You know, if if down the road we ever do experiments and somebody flies somewhere, well, maybe that'll be taken care of. We don't have any money right now, so it's not certainly not happening yet. But people need to be realistic. None of us are made of money. Uh, we can't just be flying all over the place and buying ring laser gyros. So we have to take a step. I think, Mike, I appreciate you saying that because I totally agree. Um, I don't want to be part of a online feud between various flat earth personalities I've tried to stay out of that as much as humanly possible. I've tried to just do my own research, post my videos, and ignore all the uh, uh, seemingly unnecessary nonsense that goes with it because that can only hurt us. And I'm trying to move this forward, not you know, stagnant or backwards. I don't know how anybody can be against it. I mean, you guys are doing experiments and you're sharing them with the world. There's nothing neg negative about that. I think because some people, David, they view the community as more of a social type of thing. It's like a gigantic meetup. They're not really looking to push the ball forward. They, they like maybe making videos and throwing rocks at other people and being a personality and being a celebrity. Yep. A lot play in that arena. I'm not in that arena. I'm with Jaron on this thing. We need to push this thing forward from a scientific perspective. And, uh, you know, if you want to make videos and make fun of other people and throw rocks, knock yourself out. But in the meantime, what's going to happen is you got to cut through all that. And the people that are really leaders in this community are going to push the ball forward. And that's how it's going to have more mass appeal. It's not going to have mass appeal by being a gigantic conspiratainment industry. So we have to break out of that. There's a lot of people that are, that are, I don't, maybe the word's jealous, that say that the conference is just separating the, the top brass is the term that they use. There are no top brass. It's a bunch of people that have some experience, uh, influence, have decided to get together and organize better to share, to get this out of our echo chambers. I think the conference is an amazing thing. And and if you noticed, after the conference was done, Robbie posted the entire live stream on YouTube for free. So, you know, people are complaining, oh, you have to pay $17 for the live stream. No, you don't. You can just wait three days and then it's free you know next year the ticket prices have gone up because it's a bigger venue he wants to do more things i think it's fantastic you know and and somebody needs to fund it just real quick about what david just said and i've always found this to be a problem is that people who pay for things that they know what they're getting i don't understand why we have to have these other people who interject to say that it's too expensive or no, nobody went online and saw streaming for $17 and paid that and didn't get what they paid for. So the people obviously knew they were paying for the streaming live. They paid their money. They got it. They were happy. But you have all these other people that will make up all these other reasons why it didn't need to be done that way. It could have been done for free, whatever. But I just, it always bothers me when, uh, if people are, it's just like people have problems with somebody selling a shirt. If you're selling a shirt, then the people buying the shirt see the price of the shirt. They pay it because they get the shirt. 
So for anybody to have a problem with that is crazy to me. People are just too much into other people's business. And I've already learned that there's people out there that will make a video no matter what. I've heard the same person make a video saying, I can't believe all these stupid flat earth billboards. What a stupid idea. Two weeks later, made a video saying, Patricia, you're rich. Why didn't you put up a billboard? So, you know, they'll just whatever they have to say to get people to watch them on a new day. They'll just say that. And for me, it's it's upsetting because when I make videos, I'm trying to always double check my work I'm never saying something that can't be backed up. And so there's other groups of people out there that get away with basically throwing crap at the wall all day and seeing if anything ever sticks. They're never held responsible or held accountable for gross errors or uh, accusations that never come out to fruition. So, you know, we do need to move past that. And I think that this conference started that for a lot of a lot of us by realizing that there are people here that don't even pay attention to that stuff, talking to a lot of people, hearing them say, um, you know, sometimes, Jaron, you pay too much attention to the naysayers or you mention them too often. And I learn from them because, you know, when I see my name in the sidebar of YouTube videos, you're tempted to click on it. And I've learned just this week, really, that people who watch me have such a limited amount of time to watch videos every day that they choose who they watch based on who they like. And when they see videos about me, they don't even take a second look. They don't click on them. And so I think just, you know, learning those things is huge. And I think that we'll move forward uh, with the right people making the right content and the ones who aren't will disappear or continue on in obscurity. Jaron, I have to say, I'm very proud of this effort to create this nonprofit and actually share and work on research collectively. And as I've been listening to you and David and Mike talk about this, I think it's amazing. I My hat goes off to all of you. It's amazing that you've managed to do this in a climate of so much ridicule even, you know? There's so little push that people like all of you get to do the work and to share the work and make the work known. And I have to say, as I've been listening to you describe the naysayers and the people who hurl insults and they want to just, you know, make a mud bath out of everything. I would say chaos is very easy to create. Order is very much harder to create. And it sounds to me like all of you are very seriously and methodically and intentionally trying to lift up and climb out of the chaos into a more orderly and elevated place. And I think that's great. I'm so happy to hear it. This information is open to anybody, you know, even a first time, someone that just learned about Flat Earth yesterday, they can attend the conference, they can listen to the live stream, they can wait, they can get it for free. Nobody's being separated from anybody. This is, I don't want to say it's a movement or a community, but there's so many people doing it. It's becoming a movement and it is a community. It's growing, you know, because it's real. And I think uh, it has potential. I'm to to expand exponentially this year. Jaron even threw down the gauntlet a little bit there in the conference. Um, you want to talk about that, Jaron, about NASA? Do you remember what you said? Yeah, I just put a I put a deadline for myself that, you know, 2018 was going to be the year that I end NASA just because as much as I've found about the absolute empty promises they've made and the uh, CGI images and the make-believe videos that they've sold the entire world is being real, ha has got to come to a, a stop or at least be exposed on a much larger level. And so uh, I've kind of put that deadline on myself so that I, uh, I think it's the easiest way to get a larger audience for this is to really point out, you know, the $52 million a day is, is ridiculous because you cannot find anybody who can tell you what NASA has done for humanity to deserve $52 million a day. You know, if I gave Sophia $52 million one time, and came back to her in a year or two and asked her what she did for humanity, she would have a, a never-ending list of everything that she had done that uh, were bettering the lives of, of individuals and, and groups and things that she had found and that she had uncovered and exposed. And when you look at NASA, they're getting that every single day, and they do nothing. They have had the same tin can in orbit of the Earth for 18 years, and we don't even have a 24-7 video camera feed of where we live. So I, I think that I need to push that much harder. So I kind of put a deadline for myself to um, at least make this much 
wider spread. I want to see it in the news and see the fact that people are questioning NASA and not just questioning a few things, but questioning the entire uh, plate that they have lied about for, you know, 60 years. Well, Jaron, thank you for your generosity. <laughs> yep. And and the funny thing is, Jaron, she took that $52 million, invested it in Bitcoin, and now she has $600 million. <laughs> She might be able then to send a satellite to Saturn and take some black and white pictures and then have an event where a bunch of people in a room all uh, celebrate because it crashed into Saturn and we got some final pictures. And then, you know, there's a lot of science that were le- was learned, though, so. One of the things I wanted to just to uh, circle back to for one second, guys, and, and Sophia is, you know, and I get this and I had comments like this on my last video where uh, people turn around and say that it's all about the money, that we're all in it for the money, that somehow they believe there's some kind of windfall or some kind of check that we're receiving on a weekly basis to get compensated for what we're doing. My, my channel is not even monetized. The only money I make on it is I get paid some pittance of royalties because my songs are attached to the end of uh, of my shows. So everything that I do basically is on my nickel. Made, we don't get made. paid weekly. We get paid biweekly. <laughs> we don't get paid at all. I mean, but you can't convince the people otherwise. The more you say you don't get paid, they're like, you're getting paid. Well, they could say it Thank all they want, I, but I'm going to keep putting it out there, David, that there's no, there's no money in this. So people are doing this because they feel it's the right thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the money that I do make, which has come from Patreon, um, you know, there's $800 a month there that, you know, took a while to build up. It started at $100 and slowly people have uh, joined in. So that $800 is awesome. And with the, you know, recent YouTube changes in the monetization, a lot of my videos, you know, people know I do all, all conspiracy videos. So a huge percentage of my videos are not advertiser friendly. And the ones that are, are never my, you know, million dollar view hits or anything. I've got two videos, I think with a million views, neither one of those can be monetized. So on the ad money, even with Globusters, my show, Jaronism Raw, is less than that 800 a month total. So, you know, I'm not even making half of what I have to pay to live, which my bills are like 3000 I'm not even making that in YouTube. And I do it more than full time. Um, luckily, we have our bookstore. My wife does that. And on the side, I buy from auctions and we make ends meet barely. But the only reason I'm fighting so hard and working so many hours, I used to complain about working 70 hours a week at CVS. But now if you really talk about, I don't do anything else. So people might go to movies, they might go to sporting events, they might go to the club, they might go to the bar on weekends. I don't do any of that. I haven't taken my wife to a movie in three years. Not because she wants to go, she doesn't want to go. She wants to research just like I do. We have our Monday night show on TFR that we make no money on. So, I mean, all these things are just crazy to me that people can't see that, uh, like Mike said, I do this because uh, once you know the truth, you don't have an option. My my other option would be to go back to life and forget about what I've uncovered and researched. And I can't, I can't do that. So whether I make $1,500 a month doing it or whether I make zero, all that that does is change the amount of time and effort I can spend on preaching the truth. Right now, I'm uh, doing most of my time doing that. And eventually, maybe it'll be less. I hope one day it could be even more. But for anybody to think that we are collecting a check or there's some sort of kickback or money coming to us in some magical way, there's not. And, uh, you know, I, I, when I lost my house or when I was lo- losing my house because of really flat earth and, and focusing on that, at the time we had 40 bitcoins. And as we were doing YouTube videos, we didn't have, we weren't making money. So we just kept cashing in these bitcoins, which were $200, $300 to live. Well, now those 40 bitcoins would be worth close to $350,000. So really, if you want to really look at it, (laughs) Flat Earth has cost me that because the only reason I sold those Bitcoins is because I was busy doing Flat Earth videos. And if there was no Flat Earth in my life, you know, then I wouldn't have needed to cash those out. So of course, I never look back at the past and and say I regret anything because can't change it. We can only look forward. But uh, anybody who thinks that anybody's doing this for money is, is out of their mind. We're making conspiracy videos. I could be making videos about eating fruit loops by the you know, bowl fool and be making oh, much shape or yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. And, and those are the people that seem to get all the subscribers and they, you know, make all, and of course those are advertiser friendly, you know, nobody's booting those from um, advertising. But if you do a video about George Bush being responsible for Kennedy's death, or if you do a video where Clinton knew about nine 11, uh, believe me, those videos are not allowed to be monetized and they take 
time. I mean, you guys know how to make video. You guys make videos. Sometimes you'll work on those videos for 25, 30, 40 hours and to just get nothing for them because you're trying to push the truth. And then you've got people who make a five minute video of them with their iPhone saying this person's a shill. He does everything for money. It's really a joke. There's no problem with being compensated for doing the work. Like you said, Jaron, it's a lot of work to do this, to do the, uh, the editing, putting the videos together, setting up interviews. It's a lot of work. And my response to folks is, but the people that lie to you every single day get paid very, very well. I don't right. see you complaining about them, but you complain about the people who may get compensated one way or another in some fashion who are trying to get the truth out there. That's a problem. But the people that lie to you. It's amazing that people don't see that, Mike. That is that is what is wrong with the world. Exactly. Exactly, David. It, it's mind boggling that people don't see it. And, and I left CVS because they rob customers. They They don't care about people. They don't care about employees. They purposely gouge customers and I couldn't take it anymore as a store manager because it was basically my job to carry out their dirty work. And so I got out of the system and my wife and I decided to work from home and sell books from home because we wanted to support small businesses and to grow that independent kind of mentality. And then to have people saying, oh, you're doing it all for money. Well, I'm trying to, to make enough money to live while at the same time changing the world. It's not an easy task. And believe me, staying at CVS, yeah, I could have done that. I could have made, I was making 90000 a year. And, you know, I left because of the way that they were um, using me to basically do their dirty work to both customers and employees. So, you know, I, I think I made the right decision. I would never look back on that decision, surely. But it certainly wasn't a decision I made for money. I'd like to say something. I've been listening to all this, and I want to remind us and other people out there that we're not transacting in or dealing in fiat currency here. We still require a measure of fiat currency to pay bills, but you're really transacting in richness of a whole different kind. And that's what we have to remember. So these people who are throwing insults at you about how much fiat currency you're trying to make out of this work, that's not the world you're even in. You're in a different kind of value. Do you see what I'm saying? And the more we focus on how important that value is and how unimportant quantities of fiat currency gained for those activities really is, then you start changing, I think, the language. I'm not trying to be too new agey here, but we have to focus on the other kind of richness and this whole other kind of value that is the real language and the real environment in which we're dealing. And that, to me, is worth way, way more. And if you focus on that, it's going to turn the tables and bring you more and more opportunities. Sophia, let me say one thing about that that's incredible to me, that for 14 years working as a store manager for a drugstore, a drugstore that is selling pharmaceuticals that I now see um, do nothing but uh, you know mask your symptoms and, and even continue them at, at best, and make these um, big pharma companies, you know, extreme profits. They don't care when they, you know, kill a few people. They, you know, they just pay off these fines or whatever. And then I was also wrongfully terminating employees based on rules. I was hiring people at $8 an hour and not allowed to hire them at full time. So you're giving this person three day a week, you know, basically causing people hard, hardships. I was... Um, causing customers hardships with some of the policies that CVS had. So all of that, and I was making money and never one time, not one time did anybody ever say anything to me about, hey, you're making this money and look at all the bad that you're doing. Never one time. Yet I get out of that world. I drop all my bank accounts. I have no more credit cards. I've got no more car bills. I've got no more direct TV. I've got no satellite cable TV. We've gone to the bare minimum to get by. I make videos preaching the truth. I make videos trying to expose the crimes being done by these elite organizations who could care less about anybody. And everywhere I look, I'm being accused of doing this for money or being in it for the, and talk about when you get to see it from my perspective, you just see it as all part of the, part of the plan. It's all exactly what the elite wants. They want nobody to say a word when I'm working for them. The second I decide to work against them, they have trained people to go after me. And that is why the world is the way it is. 
because everyone I can just imagine who has gone through what I've gone through would have the same exact story going from nobody saying a word about what you're doing. You just go to work every day and come home and Hey, you're earning money and you've got your expensive car and you buy your dinners and you go to restaurants and everything's fantastic. But then you try and buck the system and you get it from every single angle. It's just crazy to see that once you see it from this perspective, because you know how hard it must be for people to get out of the system when as soon as you do, man, you're hit from every angle by people who assume that you're doing something nefarious because heaven forbid you're not like them and just another rat in the maze. Yeah, many people, Jaron, they are the gatekeepers of the matrix or the AI and they don't even realize it. They actually, they are the defenders of the deception and the truth. You know, I experienced that when I started to look into 9-11 and I made 9-11 mysteries. There were people who hurled insults at me and said, I was even told that I should get a real job and then I would have money and then I could do all my research and give away all my findings and do all the interviews and you know I'd have money to make bumper stickers and t-shirts and I could give them all away and I would do that all in my spare time if I could just go out and get a real job and then shut up right and not have a store so I laugh now and I realize that the store that I have, Avatar Products, I'm bringing people things that help them. I'm sharing things that I've discovered and I get compensated for it in, you know, a small way. And the whole thing, though, is that we can't allow ourselves to be bashed and bashed up and demoralized. And that's the point of this. And I would say that there are two kinds of trolls and bashers in that setting that you're describing, Jaron, there are the ones who, they're just part of, I'm sorry to say this, but it strikes me anyway, as the lower echelons of humanity that want to jeer and sneer and make you feel bad. And I don't know what the plan is there. Do they feel that bad that they have to cast that yuckiness onto somebody else and feel vindicated? But there's also, I think, the kind of basher that is a professional troll that is put out there that works in some high rise in some city and is paid by the perps, the powers that be, to bash and trash a person like you who's putting out information that's highly against the rules, right? Yep. I think I totally agree that there are people that are paid to do that because they're the people who will just... Uh fling a hundred different accusations and you see the video and you laugh because you're like, man, these are crazy accusations. Who would ever, you know, where do they get this stuff? And then, then you start hearing it. You start hearing it repeated and, you know, nothing can be more frustrating than that because people are not doing their own research. They're just listening to these people that, uh, you're right, are probably paid for uh, by governments or whatever that uh, simply go around to cause trouble, to create division. And, you know, we're all in a tough industry because we're already in that truth industry where you've realized that you've been lied to and that pretty much in every aspect of your life you've been lied to. And so I've always said that the word shill in the truth movement is so devastating because there doesn't even have to be shills. You just say the word and it causes distrust in every single person. So that now rather than trusting and moving forward as a group and um, as a collective unit, you are constantly on the lookout for who's coming from behind, who's going to infiltrate, who's going to wreck things. And it just creates a, an unsteady kind of workplace, if you will. I've always said the thing about science that they do well, at least, is they're a cohesive unit. Lawrence Krauss probably doesn't have any of the same beliefs that Neil deGrasse Tyson has, but they don't air that out in public. They would never throw each other under the bus. They would never call each other a shill because that creates a perception from the public's point of view of they're uncohesive, they're, they're kind of a disastrous, they are a mess. How could they get anything right if they can't even get along? Well, that's what happens to the flat earth community or what happened to the 9-11 truth community because everyone knew that we were lied to, knew that something isn't right, but instead they decided to argue with each other over semantics, over, well, it was this, it was you know space-based weapons, no, it was you know, it was CGI. No, you know, so instead of joining together and aiming our attention at the people doing the damage, the people who actually knowingly allowed this to happen, they instead fight with each other. And that's why you go 15 years and just have a lot of great videos and a lot of stuff, but nobody's ever gone to jail. 
nobody's uh, ever been called in front of the for you know public disgrace as they should be. So it's just uh, sad when you see that because really the difference between being a cohesive unit like science is where they look like they got their shit together. Sure, they're lying on in a lot of aspects and they're you know basing things off theoretical um, imaginations, but they at least know how to appear to be all together. And for the same, and, you know, the flat earth could learn a lot from that. We are not all going to ever agree ever. And in fact, that would be the most worthless existence ever. Who wants to live in a life where we all agree? Then, you know, there would only be one restaurant ever because that's ever all anybody would want to eat. And we would only have one channel on TV because everyone would want to watch that. I mean, it would just be miserable if we all agreed. So I don't know why the truth community has such a hard time recognizing that we can agree on the overwhelming evidence that we are being enslaved um, by a you know a debt controlled money system and uh, elite group that could care less about you and move forward with that and understand that hey you may have a differing opinion on what happened at 9/11 but we both agree on the you know overarching control mechanism that it, you know that orchestrated it and i just have a hard time that people can't see that and and be able to move forward so that's the great thing too about fe core at least as a group, we all recognize that we believe different things, uh, maybe have a different map or model, but we don't care about that because we just want to do experiments, which will help us get closer to the truth. There's uh, so many different responses. We have people that love the conference and you know can't wait to go next year, glad it's bigger because more people want to go. Then you have the haters that are you know, saying it's divisive and whatever. One thing you won't hear, though, is the science community, Neil deGrasse Tyson, or Bill Lye coming out and throwing some science down, telling us why we're wrong. They will ignore this. That in, in itself is very telling, in my opinion. Well, I'm very glad that we had the chance to do this discussion. And I wish the best with all my heart to all the people who are doing the research. I have to say that the time of my little discovery is rolling around again, which is December 11th, 12th, 13th, we're going to start having longer evenings. Thank you. <laughs> the sunrise sunset creep is beginning. and Sunrise will be later and later until the uh, 12th, 13th of January. But I'm really looking forward to this coming turn of events, which is going to be a lot sooner than the 21st that I waited for. So I would like to present that to the world somehow, but I'm just not smart enough. I can't explain it. Um, I have a question before we, it seems like we're ready to wrap this up. Um, what do you guys think would be an improvement for next year? What would you like to see in the conference? I'll tell you, I'll start with what I would like is additional uh, rooms with a side seminars going on. So when uh, pastor Dean, for example, speaks, you can go watch uh, something else or, just have a couple of options, some workshops. I plan on doing a workshop on how to talk to friends and family about Flat Earth. And it all should be for free, and everyone should be able to come for free and yeah. drink tea and coffee for free. Free, free, <laughs> free, free lunch. Free, free rental day. cars, free hotel rooms. Yeah, it should free. all be free. Well, you know, David, yeah. that's how 9-11 Mysteries started. I had a friend who was a lawyer, and I asked him if he could let me use his conference room on a Saturday, and Brad and I showed videos and uh, shared material with, I invited the smartest people and the most open people and the most educated people that I knew, including some famous writers and journalists that, that I knew at that time. And not everybody came. Some of the most famous people obviously didn't want to pay a bit of attention to me. But a friend of mine showed up from LA and he had a bad back and he was standing, he was hanging around in the doorway. And he just said to me, you have to take this on the road. I said, really? Where? He said, LA. I'll promote you. And we rented, um, we didn't really rent. We just did it in libraries and places like that. And he called me and said, what do you want to call this? And boom, just like that. I said, 9-11 Mysteries. That's what we have to call it. So look, you can do that with your workshop. You can start the Flat Earth American Tour. <laughs> sure. I mean, I do it every day, pretty much, whenever I'm talking to people about it. So I will offer uh, reading materials for free. And that is it. So that's that's my goal. My goal is to help people talk to people that don't know because we're all here, us four, we already know. I'm hoping that people that don't know are listening to this and will do their own research. 
To answer your question, David, I would like to see research and science dominate the conference. That's really what I would like to see. It's not pushing aside anybody's belief system. I, I really do believe it needs to be research and science based. Yep. I, I like that. Yep. I think, like you said, David, having little breakout sessions to where, you know, Cami does her thing with rocks. Maybe people are interested in uh, her holding a little session where she, you know, shows her rocks and, and the magnetics that she's discovered. So I think if you could have five or six options for people and kind of let them have like a menu card where they select where they'll be going uh, each. I think that'd be very cool. And, and each person would get out of it something more unique to them and what they wanted to learn about it. And maybe we have a room that's a debate where, you know, you and I could, you know, debate somebody who believes in the globe and let people see how that interaction happens live. I mean, there's so many options. Nobody believes in the globe. Come on. (laughs) So ridiculous. They watch the sunset and then they, they imagine that they're rolling backwards faster than the speed of sound. Yeah. That's exactly what they all do. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I use that. That's my favorite line. And people are like, no, I don't believe that. I'm like, what are you, a flat earther? <laughs> <laughs> well, I never, I never really thought about it is what they say. And that, that is exactly why we're in the situation that we're in. People haven't even thought about it. Everything they say on the news, they don't think about it. They take it in. Everything they were told in school, they just take it in and they don't think about it. Oh, if I repeat that and write it down, I get an A. They keep doing tests and they are, uh, you know, little surveys or whatever. And I think it keeps coming out that like a third of Americans think that the sun goes around the earth. And that's just funny because that's that's how much they don't pay attention, that that's not at all what the mainstream belief is. But they just know that to be true because we can go outside and watch the sun move across the sky. So it's only the people that kind of remember their schooling that say, no, no, we go around the sun. But the other people are just like, oh, clearly the sun goes around the earth. Um but uh, hopefully by a year from now, maybe we can get that number up to 50%. In two years, 100%. Science is done. That's my hope. It's a good hope. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mention it's a pipe dream. I won't. Well, Sophia, thank you for hosting the show. And uh, I'll wrap it up. David, thank you so much. Jaron, thank you so much for your input and your insights. And uh, uh, we'll just keep pushing the ball forward. Thank you, guys. All right. Peace. Hi, this is Sophia adding a special ending message to the show. A couple of friends and I created a website called flatearthminerals.com. It offers three products from the flat earth that have the power to put your well-being on the rebound. These three things are iodine, magnesium, and a liquid I discovered recently called Restore. Every one of your cells needs iodine and magnesium, and Restore extracted from pristine desert earth, helps immeasurably with what is called redox signaling, your body's internal energy-making language. Flat Earth Minerals offers a trial pack of all three, iodine, magnesium, and Restore, with only $5 shipping. It's easy to build your body back with things that are basic, not complex, expensive formulations that crowd the marketplace and confuse you. Visit FlatEarthMinerals.com with its gifts from the Flat Earth to help you and your cells.